Uh, I'd like to do two things, <coughs> if you don't mind. The first is I'd like to talk about leadership in general and, and uh, kind of set the frame for how I'm talking, what I'm thinking, and what I believe would be a powerful notion and uh, framework for us to be thinking about in the church and, and as we're doing our work in your small business, in your family, in your communities, but maybe especially in the church. <clears throat> and it's a little bit counter to what we usually do when we talk about leadership. The second thing I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about um, the subject of what's going on in our church in North America with regard to young adults. I'm not going to lie to you. I am just, my heart burns with passion for that group between probably about 20 and 30 and what's going on in Seventh-day Adventism. Uh, frankly, uh, it goes well beyond that, but we feel it pretty profoundly, don't we? Have been feeling it fairly profoundly. And, and I don't know if you're like me, but you, you may have wondered, how, how are we going to survive? How are we going to make it through this thing? Uh, and, and not just become a church that is older and older and older. Um, what, what must change? <clears throat> and I believe that the subject of leadership is key and core and central to this conversation. So we're going to do those two things, if you don't mind. <clears throat> All right? So, <clears throat> and as, as he mentioned, I'm the director of the undergraduate leadership program, which usually causes people to go, yeah, what? <laughs> At Edison University now, uh, and I was brought here to launch this program about seven years ago. This is our, my eighth year I'm rolling into. Uh, I was invited to come and create an environment, create opportunity for undergrad students, no matter who they were, what they were pursuing, what they were studying, to develop further in leadership. Now, the people who are asking me when I ask them, okay, well, tell me what your vision is for who you really mean this might be for. Tell me a little bit more about how you think this should work. And their base response was, well, but that's why we were bringing you here. Would be that you would be able to tell us, because I've been doing some work in developing curriculum for, for leadership for high school students and college students. <coughs> I said, all right then. <clears throat> Great. I love that response. Let me tell you what I think, what, what I would like to try, what I believe. And that is that by virtue of the fact that these individuals have been accepted into this university, you have already tagged them as leaders. I don't need to ask who this should be for. You've answered it. Anyone who comes to Andrews University ought to be developing in this way. They're going to be shapers, changers, influencers in the world around us. So I just need to know which ones of them are interested in growing because leadership is not the kind of developmental area you can do with somebody against their will. It just doesn't work. So uh, now at Andrews University, students can, of course, we do a lot of co-curricular and extracurricular activities that any student can in, partake in. We do a lot of training and, and development with different groups that ask us. We are a central there in the campus center right outside of the gazebo, so students flow in and out of our offices all the time for any random number of reasons. But in addition, we offer academic coursework that students can take as electives. They can achieve an academic certificate in leadership that sits on their resume as the degree designation below a minor, no matter what their degree is. And in fact, they can uh, now achieve a minor in leadership as well. Some people usually follow on that question with, well, are you going to do a major in leadership? And I would say this, I believe leadership to be <clears throat> the carrier system for whatever your big deal is, right? Um, I, uh, um, you, sir, what do you do? Nothing. Nothing? <laughs> Has he been sitting in this room the whole time just since it was built? Come on, what, 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 do, you, what do you do? Uh, Career. Well, I'm in ministry. Okay, in ministry. So, did you, did you prepare for it through a theology program? No. No, how'd you prepare? Inspiration. Inspiration. <clears throat> I'm betting that you've been, been doing Bible study and a variety of things. Do you have degree preparation of any sort? Uh, finance. <clears throat> Fascinating, isn't it? And by the way, this is, this is uh, 
far more typical than sometimes where we are led to believe when we're going through undergraduate school, right? We're supposed to get this thing right, and nobody's telling us actually, if you look around here, very few of the people who are at the university even are actually working in the area of what they studied in undergraduate school, which tells you a little something. And I think that somebody suggested that uh, the average American worker changes what they would call at least micro level, changes career on average 10 times. Wow. Interesting though, if we were to prepare you with a theology degree, uh, the, the, the real and vast truth is that's, that's more technical. That's, that has a lot to do with what's going on up here. But you know in ministry, the delivery systems for what you're doing aren't necessarily theological training. To sit with somebody who's struggling with depression, to sit with somebody who you can tell they really need to repent, to sit with somebody who as you are dialoguing with them, you realize there was something you said in a sermon that really irritated them. That's all human intelligence stuff, in a human interactive, emotional intelligence, social intelligences, right? Communications, some people call these soft skills, which of course downplays their importance, just the name of it, right? Because somebody out there is doing math and they're going, these are hard skills. And then somebody else says, yeah, but in the end, I got to actually convince this person that this is even a worthy notion of what this product is we're building or whatever. So our approach is to say we're going to build up the skills that allow people to deliver on whatever their technical build is. Because here's what we know. A graduate from under, undergraduate school today, the public at large makes three base assumptions about them. One. You know some stuff. Not necessarily what I need you to know, but you know some stuff. In fact, I'm worried about you if you think you know more than you actually know. Number two is pretty hopeful, and that is you've demonstrated your capacity to learn some stuff. And that's good because the things that I do need to teach you, maybe you can learn those things. But the third assumption is you're still too dangerous to hire. I can't trust you. You are underdeveloped. Graduating from undergraduate school today, the assumption is you are underdeveloped when it comes to human interaction. And I've got 10 people applying for one job, so I don't have to settle for somebody who is dangerous, somebody who will ruin my client base, somebody who will turn parishioners or students away, or my patients will sue us more often because of bedside manner or whatever else. <coughs> This creates actually a really great reality, and that is if you are developing in those areas, you stand out in amazing ways. So students who are developing in these sorts of ways, finding the triggers in their resume to say, hey, let's talk about this subject because I'm developing here, um, we have noticed it has made massive differences for them to combine with their pre-med biology degree, an undergraduate leadership minor. To combine with my teaching degree, a certificate in leadership, I had a student in engineering who had always wanted to take some of our leadership courses. His friends had been doing so. They really loved them, vastly different than anything else they were doing. Just never had the spot to be able to take it. And so his senior year, first semester, he was able to take our fundamentals of leadership course. At the end of that semester, right around Christmas time, before the break, he comes to me and says, Pastor Dave, <clears throat> I just need to talk to you. Here's the situation. Over Christmas, I'm going to interview out in California with a firm that I really want the job. But I did a little research and I know this. <clears throat> They're bringing 10 of us from around the country in to interview. And here's the deal. Every one of the 10 will be graduating with an engineering degree. So that doesn't mean anything. And we're all high GPA students. So that doesn't mean anything. Why will they pick me? I said to this young man, look, here's what I know. You had to have those things to get in the room, but now you're in the room. Here's what I know. <coughs> those responsible for hiring will be deeply suspicious that you're underdeveloped with regard to human interaction, that you know yourself well, that you understand leadership impact, and they're hungry for people who have that. You know some things about yourself, even just in this short one little course, lean straight into it. He came back after the Christmas break and said, Pastor Dave, we spent a full 50% of our time talking about leadership issues. I got it. If that were just one, the one story, it'd be one thing. But I can go down 
item after item after item. We have a young lady right now in dental school at Loma Linda with a full ride scholarship because of, through the Air Force because of her leadership change project in our program. And I could keep going and going and going and going. And broad differences of categories and so on. So let's talk about what leadership is. Um, let me just ask that question of you. <clears throat> what would you say leadership is? So let's just, let's just have a little free flow for a couple of moments. Influence. Influence. Serving. Example. <clears throat> Somebody from the back row area over here. Empowering. Empowering. Training. Training. Passionate. Passion. Being willing to listen. Being willing to listen. Making disciples. <clears throat> Making disciples. Boy, I could go, we could go deep there. I, shh, they'll never hear this on camera. Here's the thing. It is my strong belief <clears throat> that leadership for the 20 year old is the disinfected word for evangelism. We could take a trail there for a long ways, but shh, that was just between you and I. <laughs> All right, here's what I'd like to do, <clears throat> because you've been sitting for a little bit. I need a volunteer. I need a volunteer, somebody willing, uh, and just somebody from, uh, let's not have you be in the front row. Let's have somebody from second row back, somebody uh, some of you may need to understand the definition of volunteer. <laughs> Can we pull somebody in? <laughs> That's what was happening. Yeah. The, guy in blue shirt. the guy in the blue shirt? I want somebody in the back there who's hesitant, because I can tell you're eager and you're willing. Blue shirt beast. <laughs> stand up, stand up, stand up. <laughs> now, before you go anywhere, beast, uh, what's your name? Nelson. <laughs> Nelson? Okay, Nelson. When, when we begin the demonstration, you will start from where you are now. You don't have to have your leg perched on a chair or anything, but we'll start from there. Okay? So I'm going to have you step out, and Brian, would you mind taking him down around the corner? What I'd like is for him to be around the corner far enough where he can't hear what we're talking about. Okay? So Nelson, when we are ready to begin the illustration, you'll start back right back where you were. Okay? We'll give you some instructions and then you'll begin. Take your time. Really, seriously. <laughs> Slow down even. It'd be wonderful. All right. <coughs> How many of you played the game Hot and Cold? Do you know that game? <coughs> this isn't exactly that. It's a modified version. Here's what we're going to do. Brian's going to, not Brian, um, uh, Nelson's going to come back over here. And then I'd like to, I'd like to, uh, do you think he's pretty sharp? Do you feel confident in Nelson? <laughs> we're getting some... All right, so we're going to pick a single task that we want him to do. Uh, okay, so let's have him do this. <clears throat> Here's what we want him to do. We want him to touch or pick up this, this hymnal right here. The, yeah, the red, the red hymnal. Okay, if he touches that, Done. Okay? But here's how we're going to do this. <clears throat> and in fact, let's... Boy, where is going to be the easy way around? It's going to be Because right there's not a good way around here. But here's what we're going to do. <clears throat> we're going to guide him around the room with our noises. Okay? So uh, the noises are going to be applause, yeah, cheering, anything that sounds positive. Or then murmuring to even open booing. Uh, it's always interesting to me how much people who are saved by the grace of Jesus Christ love to boo other people. <laughs> <clears throat> so here's, here's the deal, though. So we'll have him. Boy, I just wish there were a little more room to get around here. You know, do you guys want to just, just, just make a little more room? Because what I'd like to do is, so rather than him going that way, so if he starts going that way, we start giving him a little bit of negative kind of feedback. If he turns the right direction, yeah, we'll give him a little bit of positive feedback. If he starts going around here, we're going to get, you know, we're going to get a little bit more. So you got to give yourself some room. You don't go nuts initially when he makes the first positive move or else it's just very confusing, right? You're going to have to let it build if, as he keeps coming up. He'll probably come up here. He might get to a point where he turns around like he thinks that we're supposed to do something here. Uh, and, and so we're just going to keep moving him 
let it build if he stops. You know, take a second, but then start giving him, and then let that build, you know, whatever, right? Until he starts making a positive move. Here's what we're not going to do. <coughs> we're not going to use any words other than my instructions once he's back. And we're going to have a little faith in Nelson. <laughs> so, so let's not, let's not do one of these, you know, deals of... <laughs> You know, right? S signaling to red colors. No, no, we're just going to make the noises. All right? Fair enough? Got it all clear? Yep. All right? All right. Would you mind, sir? Would you mind letting the note come back in? <coughs> they may have left. He's probably outside of the door. All right. Yeah, right. Just so kind of perched there, listening. It's a very scary task, so it's probably it's probably wise. <clears throat> All right. So let me just pause and ask. Let me get a sense of the room then. Let me get a sense of the room. <coughs> How many of you live within 10 miles of this location right here? I'll raise my hand to that. So what other locations are represented here? California. California. How many Californians? All right. Yeah. Very nice. Dressed warmly. <laughs> north face. Yeah. Uh, it, this, is, this is considered, by the way, the north face of uh, Michigan. Uh, no, you can, you can come in. All right. All right, Nelson, you, you, you think, think your way through my last instructions. Just a test. Yeah, you're going right back there. Okay, so this is going to happen, Nelson. <coughs> the room here, outside of Brian, who's going to jump in quickly, has to you can stay standing. The, the room here is committed to uh, the following. One, we're not going to, once I'm done uh, speaking these instructions, unless something goes horribly wrong. Uh, we won't be using words uh, to uh, describe further what's happening. I'm going to give you some instructions, and then from there, we're not going to talk. Okay? We have picked a task in the room. It is in this very room, a task for you to accomplish. We've kind of discussed a little bit your capabilities and intellect and so on, and we've picked a task that I feel strongly, some question, but I feel strongly you can do this. <clears throat> So, it's in this room, you can definitely do this. So, uh, third thing, we will help you do it, okay? <clears throat> we will absolutely help you do it, even if it feels a little bit at times like we're not helping, <clears throat> we're committed to helping you do it. We'll stick with you until you get this task accomplished, okay? Make sense so far? Yeah. All right, so uh, my question for you now is, would you like a hint or a, a tip? Sure. Okay, so here's the tip. When in doubt, do something. I've done this activity with a lot of people around the world and I've, I've never yet picked nothing as the task. So it is something. Do something. We can help you if you're experimenting. We can help you if you're trying something. Okay? All right? Sure. Ready? Begin. <laughs>
Nelson, you have achieved the task, my friend. Very well done. I mean, many, many really doubted you. And I tried to say, look, he's wearing a beast shirt. He's had to overcome so much. So go ahead and have a seat there, Nelson. So now my question for you, a couple of, couple of observations. Let's pretend we're web. This isn't live right now, is it, on camera? This is being recorded, not live, webcast. But let's pretend it was webcast, and let's pretend the sound went out. And so people were just watching what was happening, and maybe the multiple camera angles, so you could get a sense of everything. Who would be the star of the show? Us. No. Yeah? No. Oh, wait, wait. no sound. No, no sound. Nelson would be the star. Why is he the star of the show? He, well, we're all on the screen. He's doing something. He's the one who actually accomplishes the task, right? Who accomplished the task? Nelson? Nelson, Shh, let's not give him any tips. Tell me what the task was. We picked a very specific task. Is he correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. Not exactly. All he had to do was touch the book. See, he doesn't even know for sure what the task was. He picked up the book. We were going crazy, so he thinks that's the task, right? He doesn't even know what the task is. All he knows is he wants us to cheer and not boo. That's what he knows. And if this were to go long enough, which I've had happen in other situations, all he would care about is this be over, <laughs> right? We mostly me, but we <laughs> bought together this idea of what we were going to have him do, which was to touch the red book. He didn't need to pick it up, did he? No, he just did it so fast. Yay! Right. It's an interesting truth, isn't it, that usually we assign the word leadership to whoever seems to be doing the most stuff. Who is it that's the leader right this second, right? Well, I'm up here. Everybody's looking at me. I must be the leader. We've all been in rooms where the leader is not the person that's talking, sitting at the front of the room, right? Leadership has incredible subtlety. <coughs> I'm going to give you three words because when we start teaching students, <coughs> they've heard the word leadership from all kinds of people and no two of them mean the same thing. And so now we're going to teach leadership. And I have to do a lot of work just to get certain Andrews students to understand they should learn about leadership. They should be developing as leaders. Because they're thinking leadership means you have to stand up in front like Pastor Dave does and speak. That's just not, that's flatly not a good enough definition of leadership. Um, in fact, it is much deeper and broader than that. And so we usually have to kind of swing a machete at a bunch of notions and level the playing field and build back up. And we use these three words to talk about what leadership is. So leadership is, and somebody said the word influence. <coughs> uh, where'd you get that? John Maxwell. John Maxwell said leadership is influence. Nothing more and nothing less. And I'm going to say, but I want to add two words. <laughs> because I'm not quite satisfied with that. <clears throat> By the way, John Maxwell didn't come up with it. It's just he's the one who's written the most books about it. I'm going to show you in a little bit. Ellen White said something that involves the words leadership and influence in the same sentence, you know, about 100 years ago. <clears throat> so I'm going to add this word, intentional influence. It's possible to influence the world around you very haphazardly, being unintentional all the while. And in fact, we, we believe that it is a stewardship, don't we? All, that you have talents, and just because you have one, and it's not the speaking one, doesn't mean you can bury it, right? You'll be called to account for this, this great gift, this stewardship of influence, and we ought to own it, and we ought to be intentional, and with young leaders, what I say is this. You should not hear anyone say or think they are right if they do that leadership is about you positioning yourself for future impact. Leadership is about now. Leadership is today. And you have power and responsibility. You should be intentional and own it. And then there's this word, 
which I love. <coughs> Have you noticed? <coughs> There's been a lot of study uh, that's gone into kind of analyzing Fortune 500 company CEOs and their styles, their personalities, their strengths, and what is, is there a commonality between them in terms of how they bring their best to the table as a leader? And here's what we know, N not really. There's a wide range of differences. There are introverts and extroverts. There are people with strengths in this kind of thing or that kind of thing. But here's one thing that is in common. The typical CEO of a Fortune 500 company can articulate what they bring to the table, even though it's wildly different than that person or that one or that one or that one. They can articulate, they know about themselves. And this is something that comes with the ownership of intentionalities. We can start to say if individualized leadership is important, if it's not that we've got this statue of a leader up here and we're trying to see who can match the kind of, who can get into the, you know, the pose right, it's in fact chiseling away your best self, your most influential self, and it will look vastly different even in one given situation. How I would bring leadership to the table, to the fore, would be vastly different than how you would if you're doing what God's called you to. Boy, is that for you. But if you don't know much about yourself, that's going to be difficult. If I don't know who I am, if I don't know much, that's one of the things that Fortune 500 CEOs do is they know their individualized best and how they bring that to the table. So I wanted to spend some time on that. I also wanted to uh, <coughs> think about then who is a leader. And you've heard me say, I don't care. I don't care about personality. I don't care about which strengths you have. If you're an Andrews University student, just there's some data that suggests every one of us in this room are going to encounter at least four moments of significant influence today. So to go and put us in a lineup and decide, well, the people at that end are bigger leaders than those people. In fact, maybe they're not even leaders. Wait, we just said four moments of significant, significant influence every day. The question may not be who is a leader, so important, but maybe the important question is when you have those moments, can you deliver? Can you deliver? And here's the other thing that we notice. People who get used to delivering in those mo moments end up being noticed and asked to do more. And then they end up being classified as a leader. One of my favorite, favorite quotes is this one. <coughs> Abraham Lincoln is supposed to have said, everything I am or ever hope to be, I owe to my angel mother. If you study history, you would know that his mother was Nancy, Nancy Lincoln. But she died when he was nine years of age. And uh, partly out of concern for the children, his father remarried to a woman named Sarah, Sarah Lincoln. Well, that could go either way for a nine-year-old boy, couldn't it? Apparently, he became so fond of her. She was such an impact on his life that he began referring to her ever after, referring to her as his angel mother, as if sent by God. Now, frankly, I don't know. I had somebody after I said this once go and look and they found something. I don't know a single quote by Sarah Lincoln. I don't think she's written a book. I don't know anybody else who would put her on their top 10 list of leaders. But unless he's just engaging in hyperbole, what, what Abraham Lincoln is saying is, look, you want to give me any kind of credit for the amazing leadership style uh, written about over the years by Doris Kearns Goodwin or somebody else? If you want to give me any credit for all that, you know what? Let's just back off for a second. Give it to Sarah Lincoln. You want to give me credit for holding the states into the United States of America? You want to give any kind of tip of the cap to the abolition of slavery? To me, tell you what, don't do that. Give it to Sarah. And Sarah is somebody we would never notice. So the interesting question is, if I have the opportunity to teach leadership and I pass up Sarah, would I be passing up Abraham Lincoln? If I don't teach her to be able to deliver in her moments of influence, is it possible that Abraham Lincoln doesn't become Abraham Lincoln? It's possible. I don't really even need to make that choice. And then there's this, and this is something I encourage you to consider because I think this really has ramifications for our church lives. <coughs> Those are both the letter L. Capital L versus lowercase l. And here's what I've noticed. 
because I teach base level leadership dynamics, skills, awarenesses, and then we move from there. And what I notice is uh, everybody is capable of developing these human interactive skills and employing them, deploying them almost immediately. But many of us are behind the scenes. Have you noticed, I mean, you could be moved by a public speaker who is speaking to thousands, and a week later you couldn't even tell me a thing they said, but you would come away saying, leadership power. I've noticed this, and if you ever see an interview like this, pay attention. One of them that I watched was a, an interview with Bono, who was asked about the leadership influences in his life, and he named three people. I can't even remember the one that everybody would know, but the other two I know no one would know, because they're just behind the scenes people. And so they are lowercase l leaders, people who aren't getting recognition, aren't getting recognition for their leadership impact. What I find is the difference between Uppercase L and lowercase L leadership is not substance of how you lead, it is recognition. You got the name on the door, somebody identified you. And by the way, we give recognition often for very flimsy elements because you're tall and have a full head of hair if you're a man. Somebody who is a little overweight might not get the leadership recognition that actually would be attributable to their leadership impact. Stuff like that. If you're a, a woman, if you're the wrong color, if you don't know the right language, if you have an accent, if you, right? All these things end up factoring into this, but if you want to ever be this, develop here. Have, how many of you have gone to a leadership conference? I mean, that was uh, an expensive nasty one. They bring in some powerful speakers, and then what do they talk about? They talk about stuff like integrity, you know, and it's all this base level stuff that's not some like weird kind of like, oh, man, the secrets of the CEO. No, it's all the same flat base fundamental leadership elements that you could teach a child usually if you would take the time. Um, so this is very, very important from my perspective because we end up valuing people for some of the wrong reasons sometimes. And we then shine a spotlight. I like to think of it like this. If you were <coughs> out in the middle of the ocean in a rowboat, which I don't know why you would be, but if you were out in the middle of the ocean in a rowboat, just kind of rowing along, and maybe you're even looking for help, you can't see land anywhere, and on a sunny day, at some point out of the corner of the eye, you see a glint of light along the water. It's, it's unusual, of course, water shines off of the, but this was specific and different, and so you start paying attention, maybe even start rowing toward it, and then you start to key in on the fact that it is, it is glass. There's something glass you are seeing light bounce off of. And in fact, you eventually see a shape. What is it you're looking at? Interesting. You said periscope. You said submarine. So when you see this, you make an assumption. There's a submarine down there, right? And in fact, if you pay a little attention, maybe you're rowing toward it and suddenly you start to realize, row away because a submarine is breaching the surface, right? There's this big submarine there. Here's the interesting thing. When the submarine surfaces, of course, it's a submarine. Before it surfaced, was it a submarine? Before the periscope surfaced, was it a submarine? I like to think of leadership in that way. There are a lot of individuals who are under the surface of the water, lowercase l leaders, and they are deploying their leadership skills little by little. Parents of children, workers in a group, church members who don't have the positions. If they are deploying all of the right stuff that God has called them to in an individualized way, intentionally influencing their surroundings, they are leading, but in a lowercase l fashion, and then suddenly something happens and somebody catches the sun off the glass <clears throat> and decides, <clears throat> you know what, you should be in this position. But they were leading all along, way before this gets up above the surface of the water. It was a submarine, right? 
Way before my name gets on the door, I, I have to have been leading. If you want to never get your name on the door, don't lead when it's not on the door, right? So you can't just wait until you get elected to the position to be leading. So that calibrates a little bit how I'm looking at the subject of leadership. Fair so far? Because now I'd like to branch off and I'd like to talk about something quite specific. <coughs> I want to talk about our church culture. I want to talk about young adults. And we have young adults uh, in a constant flow out of the church right now, right? It's frightening. Uh, we know it from data. You know it by closing your eyes and thinking of your friends. Some of you thinking of your children, your children's friends, <clears throat> the pews of church, the seats and chairs of church where people used to be and they are not. It's kind of like this weird war where people aren't coming home after the war. And it is a frightening level of loss. I've thought about that a lot. <clears throat> and I think to myself sometimes, maybe we're not, you know, because I'll, I'll, be, I'll admit to you that sometimes people, when you have the word leadership somewhere in your title, <laughs> People think you have all the answers. I'm not so sure that I have a lot of the answers. I, I do feel like maybe I've got a couple of clues on the questions we might want to be asking. Um, we spent a lot of time lamenting the flow of young people away from church. But there is a whole other issue, isn't there? Witnessed by looking at the representation of 20 to 35 year olds at the GC sessions. Think about church leadership in the average Seventh-day Adventist church and how many 20-year-olds are involved. And then think about society. Think about the world around us. Are they as left out of leadership elsewhere? In corporate America? In small business ownership? That's a fascinating question, isn't it? I think of this parable. <clears throat> Man is standing just enjoying a walk on a sunny day by a river. Uh, there's something about water. How many of you enjoy water, uh, whether it is the ocean or a lake or uh, just, uh, just sitting, watching, or listening to the ocean waves, for instance? How fantastic. Well, he's walking along the water, and as this river is flowing by, he hears from little distance, something that's disturbing. He isn't sure exactly what to make of it because it doesn't sound like fun. It doesn't sound like play. In fact, somebody's in distress. Somebody's in the water and they're floating down the water. Well, this guy's a good swimmer. He dives in. He rushes out. He carefully takes control of the situation and helps this particular swimmer to shore. He doesn't have time even to interact about what it is that's happening because he hears someone else in the water a little further upstream. And so he's now positioning himself. And as the parable goes, he's rushing out to grab this person and he's still in the water when he can hear somebody coming close. He's barely got this person to shore when there is another one now, a third person, and in the water he goes. And now in some kind of weird old Lucille Ball episode of Candies on the conveyor belt, things are happening faster than he can actually keep control. As he starts to try to solicit people, even ones he's saved, to come in and help get people out of the water, he is rushing out to pull them ashore, pull them ashore, pull them ashore, and people are now drifting past him. They're going so fast he can't, he can't save them all. <clears throat> and of course, we could spend time talking about how to program for uh, more people to be there to help save those who are rushing past and he can't, can't help them all, except that in this parable, there's something else entirely that's happening and that he needs to ask a fundamentally different question. Because there's a bridge, there's an overpass farther up this river, and on that bridge, somebody is shoving people off the bridge faster than you can possibly get to save them. And the problem is, he's addressing a symptom rather than the issue on the bridge, right? And in fact, he's not going to catch up. And it's going to be a tough decision to walk away from that spot in the river and people just by and rush to the bridge and try to stop the flow at the bridge. 
we spent a lot of time talking about how do we attract our young adults to church? What do we do to bring young adults to church? But what if we're asking the wrong question? What if, in fact, we need to fix some things on the church? What if we have some fundamental issues there that are in some way shouldering young adults off the bridge? There's a fantastic book. I'm a reader of, uh, yeah, I just love books. There's a fantastic book that I want to share with you. <coughs> it's called uh, <clears throat> Think Better. Think Better by Tim Herson. Think Better by Tim Herson. <clears throat> he starts this book with an illustration about uh, processionary caterpillars. Do you know what processionary caterpillars are? <clears throat> this is a line. This isn't just one thing. It isn't a rope. It isn't a weird um, kind of like bush or something that falls from the trees. This is a caterpillar, caterpillar about that size. And they follow one another. What happens is morning comes, caterpillars decide they're hungry, and one cat caterpillar sets off. There isn't any particular thing that sets this caterpillar apart from the others. It's just that they got started first. They're going in search of, I think through smell or something of this nature, food. And so one caterpillar begins to move. As they move, they lay down a silk trail. And the other caterpillars kind of essentially go, ah, movement, okay, let's go. And they get up and they follow the trail. And the next one follows the trail. And the next one follows the trail. And the next one follows the trail. Until they're right behind each other, one after the other, after the other, after the other. There's a fascinating story about a naturalist, Jean-Henri Faber, in right around 1900, decided to do an experiment with these processionary caterpillars. What he did <coughs> is he got a pot, <clears throat> a pretty decent sized pot. He built a ramp up this pot and he lured processionary caterpillars, one in the lead of the others of the others of the others, up this ramp and onto the rim of this pot so that they would be going around this pot. One in the lead for no apparent reason. It's not that they were set apart by any committee or group. They're just the first one out, and so on they go, laying down a silk trail. And the next one follows, laying down a silk trail, laying down a silk trail, till they finally ring the whole rim of the pot, at which point he brushes off the others, removes the ramp. Now they're on, it's a, it's a non-stop link of processionary caterpillars on the pot. He puts in the middle of this pot on some earth that's there, he puts lettuce and a variety of other foods that are especially delightful to processionary caterpillars. And he watches to see what would happen. And the caterpillars go around. Now no one in the lead. They're just following the other one. Who's following the other one? Who's following the other one? And they go around and around. Six days. Until finally, out of exhaustion and lack of food, caterpillars begin to fall from the rim, breaking the link. <laughs> At which point, almost magically, the caterpillar who has now no longer anyone right in front of them goes, and makes a break for the center of the pot. Tim Herson writes this. As with the caterpillars in Faber's experiments, sometimes the only thing that saves us is that things go so drastically wrong that we're forced out of our processions. Our pattern has been so counterproductive that the circle we've created can no longer sustain itself. It breaks apart. With no more circle, we're forced to find new ways of doing things. We change <clears throat> only when we're forced to. Someone once said, change comes. I heard this attributed to Twain. I'm not sure if it's true. Change comes when the pain of staying the same exceeds the pain of change. And I don't know about you, but on the subject of our young adults, it's pretty painful. And we've been doing it the same way, same way, same way, same way, same way, same way, same way. But things are falling from the pot. 
and maybe it's time to make a break for it. I want to consider a few notions backed up by data um, <coughs> as we ask. As we ask ourselves, what are the right questions? What is it that's going on in the bridge? Because some of us in this room are responsible for some of what's going on on the bridge, aren't we? We have more voice now. We could speak to what's going on on the bridge. And we could spend all of our time jumping in the water trying to pull these young adults out of the water, but maybe there's something going on structurally. Maybe there is something going on in terms of how church works that would make a difference to this subject. And so I want to... Uh, Ask this question, first of all, what drives leaders? What drives, what causes leaders to want to lead? And I want to think about young adults in specific. Uh, we know this, it is not just more money. Money works only to a very low point. Same thing with issues of safety and pride and in fact, there's an individual who's written some great stuff on this. This man named Daniel Pink. Anybody know who Daniel Pink is? Okay, well, you, you owe it to yourself to read his book, Drive. The book, Drive, by Daniel Pink. And it all asks the question, what motivates people to do anything? Because we used to think, first of all, there's Motivation 1.0. And Motivation 1.0 has to do with things like safety and food and sex drive and, 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 kind of the base human elements. But then we start thinking, okay, so motivation 2.0 is the carrot and the stick. This was especially productive during the Industrial Revolution, right? As we start to ask people to work together, not in a agrarian kind of a way, but in manufacturing plants and these sorts of things. So we pay you to do this and we pay you more to do that because it's less likely anybody wants to do it or it's a little harder or whatever. <coughs> we have punishments that we uh, in, enact on people. They lose their job or they don't get the good shift or they make less money. These sorts of carrot and stick maneuvers. And Daniel Pink is suggesting that the carrot and the stick can only take us so far, and really it's pretty relegated to the Industrial Revolution, which, by the way, we're no longer in the Industrial Revolution. In fact, <clears throat> some have said we are in the information age. Others have said we have moved beyond the information age now. We are in the creative age. Isn't it true that some of those jobs that people used to say you can't get a job in that are now some of the highest paying jobs, <laughs> interestingly. So industrial revolution to information age to the creative age, what is it? What is motivation 3.0? What are they? And Daniel Pink, through research and discussion, talks about three elements of what drives people, what drives people to do anything, and what drives leaders. There are these three things. First, autonomy, freedom. Boy, especially this younger generation, they will take a job on freedom, on issues of freedom, so much faster than on issues of just higher wage. And freedom might look like what I have to wear. Freedom might work, look like what do I, I mean, I've got a, a daughter who's now married, both of them work in graphic design firms, different ones, doing different kinds of things. One is a graphic designer, one is a project manager leading customer interactions. Both of them doing extraordinarily well. You know what they both love? My mother passed away uh, in this last January. Both of them were able to continue working while coming to Pennsylvania. Just doing their work. They could move around. Um, the highly trusted. These are people in their mid-twenties, trusted with major accounts and major work, and they don't even have to come into the building. Autonomy. Freedom. Think about church for a minute. Autonomy. We will give young adults positions. We will invite them into leadership. Sometimes even still with young adults calling them somewhat junior positions. And they, out in the real world, are being asked to do major, major things. They may or 
first million, they may be starting up their own company and you don't even know. And we, we invite them to do some small thing or we give them a position, but we tell them how we do it here. And they're used to being asked, how would you prefer to do it here? In the real world. Because we're dealing with the world more and more and more. And one setting to another can be vastly different. You could be required to have a uniform in this situation or that or the other. But these are some of the notions that drive young adults today, that drive many people today. The second one is mastery. What we have found is that, and especially young adults, they prefer to be in a context where they are allowed to go after being an expert, go after expertise. That I, in this, in this context, when I step up with this area, I've been invited to be a specialist here. That I, boy, I tell you what, it's a scary thing in church environments to come off in any way like you are pursuing mastery, especially over people who are your senior. And yet that's what they're being invited to do in the real world context is bring it on some subject that we're going to turn over to you and we're going to walk back a step and then watch and see what happens. Autonomy and freedom. You get to design how you think this ought to go. Imagine we invited a 25 year old young person to be Sabbath school superintendent and have that message. One, we would like you to just figure out how people study best and how they discuss and how they explore God's word best and redesign Sabbath school. Just blow it all up if you want to. <laughs> we don't do that, do we? And I say we in the grand, we, we may, but usually we bring them alongside and we show them how it's done. And often they don't come back for day two of that because they feel trapped feel stuffed into a corner, and they don't think you want their best anyway. In the meantime, they just got an advance at work because they contributed something nobody else could. Wow. And then there's this. I uh, love this quote. Book Education, page 17, you may, I mean, I, I just love, love, love this quote. It is the work of true education to develop this power to train the youth to be thinkers and not mere reflectors of other men's thoughts. And we could just pause there for a second and ask, is that what church is like for the young adults? Come here and be a thinker. Be unique. You have autonomy. Bring this stuff that none of the rest of us even understand. Bring it. Or is the context far more, well, so here we do this. And this is the shape of things. And by the way, this is the time we do it. And this is how we dress when we do. And, 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 and. Fascinating to consider. I always love this quote and I've been involved in a variety of contexts where I would bring it up. And, one of them is as an individual, I was a youth director for a time and on the board of a boarding academy. I ended up working for that same boarding academy. But I remember as a youth director on the board of the Blue Mountain Academy board, it's a boarding academy. Anybody here go to a boarding academy by a raise of hand? So boarding academies have some interesting dynamics that no other schools do. Uh, because it's seven days a week, 24 hours a day, there are things like what time lights get turned off, sometimes back in the day electricity even gets turned off pretty much all but heat, right? Uh, you can't have radio, you can't have this, you can't have that, uh, you can't wear jeans at this time of day, you, in fact, we have arguments about whether it is jeans, is it because they're grommets or they're not grommets, you can't wear those kinds of footwear, but you can wear these kinds of footwear, you can't walk on those paths if you're a girl, or you can't sit here if you're a guy, you, right, all kinds of stuff. Just getting them down the, the kind of the, the channel <laughs> that we're looking to get to. And so what, in the, this board session, love doing this because we decided we we're going to study, the, the chair decided we we're going to study the book education and just in worship says we, for the board session as we get going and we get, we just started, page 17 right there. And, oh, this is going to be great. We're to be training young people to be 
thinkers and not mere reflectors of other men's thoughts. And I want to know what we're doing that gives them the freedom to not reflect other people's thoughts. <laughs> Walk off. One day I'm reading this. It is the work of true education. I'm thinking about that. I'm quoting it. I struggle with quoting word for word. But this particular day, I'm doing a pretty good job. It's the work of true education to develop this power. And it stops me thinking this power. What is this power? Did anybody here have a guess what this power is? What's that? Well, God's talent. say again, God's talent, God's talent. <clears throat> you're falling for the trap that I fell for. I'm just reading one sentence and trying to unpack it. Ironically, this is not all that Ellen White wrote. In fact, you might notice the incredibly indented beginning of this paragraph. This isn't the beginning of the paragraph. This is the end of the paragraph. So here's what the paragraph looks like. Every human being created in the image of God is endowed with a power. That's going to be this power, by the way, in case you weren't connecting it. Endowed with a power akin to that of the creator. What is it? Individuality. Power to think and to do. The men in whom this power, and I think she would say women too, the men and women in whom this power is developed are the men and women who bear responsibilities, who are leaders in enterprise, and who influence character. Take that, John Maxwell. It is the work of true education to develop this power, the power of individuality. I think we should have church leadership retreats where all we do is sit around a circle and ask ourselves, what are we doing in our setting to develop young leaders who have the power of individuality? Who is challenging us on what we are doing with their individuality right now? And if no one is, what is wrong with us? When you think about Daniel's, Daniel Pink's first two of three points of what motivates people to action and to be involved, having autonomy and mastery, that's two great words to talk about individuality. We often reward sameness in church leadership, that you're able to kind of keep it going the way we've been doing it. You're not rocking the boat, you're orthodox. Right? Maybe the problem isn't exactly the flow of young adults wasting past us on the river. What if we've got some structural issues in how we do church that is dumping young adults into the, into the river. We can go trying to grab them as fast as we can out of the river, but we got other issues. You, it isn't lost on you, I'm sure. It is not lost on you that every great movement of God has had young people, I mean severely young people involved at core and key levels of leadership, right? Anybody who's a Seventh-day Adventist shouldn't even have a question about this. But you look all the way through. Scripture, big moments of movement. And it's not, I mean, there are multi-generational points of input all along the way, but it is never without strong leadership from young adults and even teens. And I would have to ask, are we able to really allow individuality? I, I just give you a couple of quick thoughts. Because I end up in conversations about this. I, I can worship personally in almost any setting. If, as long as you don't take my Bible away from me, I can worship. I'm extraordinarily worship friendly. I love worship. I like to worship. And I love having a conversation with God, even in moments that I just primarily disagree with what's going on around me. Right? But I don't need a lot of change in worship to, to make me happy. But have you noticed the kinds of things we say when somebody would like to try something different that has to do with worship? And we put it all under the guise sometimes, a very sanctified conversation, 
and we dirty the pool. We actually throw out bar. One of them is we, we'll call other people's interests entertainment, and ours is not. So you have some group of young people that would like to do something with percussion. You realize piano is a percussion instrument. That's okay. It's okay. Let's just. You want? You want to, okay, this will, this will be really real, and I'm scared of cameras at this point. But you can visit church websites, big church websites, where they will tell you about their staff, they will tell you about some of your, their ministries, and then they will tell you about their pipe organ. Because it is one to two hundred thousand dollars, or it's a million dollar pipe organ, and it's a historical piece of this building. Do you know what the average 20-year-old thinks of that? They think, I don't ever want to hear you whine and complain about not having enough offerings. When you've got a million dollar piece of wood and metal that you're worshiping. And you tell me my interests are entertainment? You are obviously entertained by the organ, and that's okay. <clears throat> Just understand the hypocrisy. Because I can get our entertainment a lot cheaper in here, if you'd like. <laughs> if you want, we'll repurpose the, some of the wood of all of that as a djembe or something. I don't know, but we can do this. This is a fascinating conversation, isn't it? Here's what I know. We cannot afford to have the gap of 20 and 30 and 40 and now becoming 50-year-olds that are missing from our churches because we will not relinquish power. The third characteristic that Daniel Pink points out is purpose. People are driven by purpose. How is it possible that we're losing on this one? <laughs> How is it possible that my 25-year-old daughter finds more purpose and mission in her workplace than in the church? How, how is this possible? And yet our young adults listen to us and what we're interested in and how we are so slavishly hanging on to yesterday's approaches to stuff like evangelism and we won't ever honor their new kind of radical weird idea of how to reach out to the community or be involved in social justice or be involved in, in the troubles of the poor and they're wondering what is wrong with you people? You seem so bent to mail things to people. We don't even use mail anymore. They're thinking. You're so interested do things that will get people into our rooms. People just outside our walls are dying. Don't talk to me about purpose. My job cares more about my community than you seem to. That, that's what they're saying. How can we pop that? We, there's no way. We've got everything we need for this one, right? But we've got to be willing to allow a young adult to come in and go, hey, 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 I got a whole new idea about this thing. We should be fired up about that thing. What I'd like to do is the fellowship hall. I would like to just, I would like to put bunk beds in there, and I would like to bring people in. We're going to have to do some work. But there are there are people on our streets. I'd like to put in there. Ah, you know what? Thing thing is though, that's a, doubtless that's going to ruin the carpet. When, when, we, when we got the money donated, there were certain rules put in place. A little metaphor. I don't know how many of you <clears throat> enjoy the uh, enjoy the game Monopoly. <clears throat> do you like? How many of you played Monopoly by raising uh, hand? Do you enjoy? How many of you do not enjoy Monopoly? You do not like Monopoly. You played it though. You have played it, but you don't. See, uh, so I don't know how this happened, but in my family, my children have decided that if we play Monopoly, I'm going to win. 
not, I do a fair amount, that's all right, but I don't, they give me a little bit more kind of reverence and credit on this than what I deserve. Uh, I do really enjoy strategy and games, and especially games where uh, you know negotiating gets involved. I like that as well. My wife will not play. Period. She tells me that this is because her two older brothers used to make her play. Two older brothers, easily taking advantage of her. And but here's the kicker. Here's have have you been playing at some point? You're doing okay, and then you start to realize. This isn't going to work out. Uh, I cannot think of any way to leverage Baltic Avenue into a great big empire. And I don't know what I was thinking about those railroads, but at this point I'm in deep trouble. And somebody else has all kinds of stuff and, and you're just hemorrhaging money and properties and it's just going badly, right? You know you lost. And then the people you're playing with, especially that one guy who's in lead, won't let you quit. <laughs> That's what would happen to her. Her brothers wouldn't let her quit. They would keep sending her around the board. Hey, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, I'll take your orange properties and I'll let you live. <laughs> now, little by little, sucking the life out of her, right? This is what our young adults feel about church. That they have lost, but we don't want to let them quit playing. We want them to keep going around the board so we can keep draining some money out of them. But we're the ones who are in charge. And they're starting to want to have nothing to do with it. There's power in this room, right? We have the keys to the game closet here. We could stop playing Monopoly, and this is metaphorical, and I'm not sure I've actually thought through all of the points of this metaphor, but what if our young people would rather play Risk than Monopoly? We're the ones with the keys to the game closet. We need to start giving away some power. We need to start giving away autonomy. We need to start giving away and allowing mastery and developing new approaches to the purpose that we share. We need fresh leadership. We are dying. Man, it's, it's so powerfully painted. Uh, there was a graphic you probably saw, came out in Spectrum Magazine, was reproduced in a bunch of different places. Spectrum probably got it from somewhere else, but it was, it was a graphic representation of faces for the different age groups that were at the GC sessions. Our young adults are not involved in church leadership, and our young adults do not intend to attend and not be involved in leadership. That's the problem on the bridge. So we got a choice. We're going to do some token thing now. <laughs> or are we going to really shake some stuff up? Allow young adults to be at their best among us, unique and different as they and we, some of you here, are. That's the deep, desperate hope I have. But something's got to change because we're not, we're not dragging them out of the river fast enough, not nearly. And I don't really think we're going to. Something's got to change. I'd like to pray over this and then question and answer, whatever you want. Okay. Father, <clears throat> when we talk about stuff like this often, I feel, we feel like, man, the people who are responsible for this need to wake up and do something. But what if we are the people that are responsible? You change the world with far fewer people than are in this room. You barely need 12. So there's plenty here. May you convict our hearts. May you take advantage of our resources, of our mindset, of our capacities, of our willingness. And maybe you could help us ask the right questions. Go to the right places for the fix. Lord, it just does, it does feel so desperate. And I've got three young adults of my own children. And I am just so stricken with how badly we are losing this war. Please, 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 before it's too late, please help us be brave and courageous. 
and to try something that might make a difference for this group of people we are so concerned about. And maybe in doing so, our whole environment can change. So we trust you, we listen to you, bless us in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.